thank you to the foundation for inviting us to be here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear about all the work that's going on. It's really exciting. Um, so let me just jump right into the next slide. Um, and let me change my screen here. All right, I think we're good. Um, so IONIS develops what are called RNA targeted therapeutics um, or antisense therapeutics or antisense medicines, antisense oligonucleotides. These are all the same word. Um, ASO is an abbreviation for antisense oligonucleotide. I've been told to try to say antisense medicine, but I'm going to slip up and say ASO is a lot, I'm sure of it. So know that I'm talking about the same thing with all those words. And I'll describe what those are here in a little bit. We are a biotech company that was founded in 1989 to do this, to develop this new type of drug, and we're located in Carlsbad, California. Over on the right side, these antisense medicines are aimed to disrupt the disease process. We have three that have been approved fairly recently. They're shown there at the bottom, Spinraza, Tegsetti, and Relivra, and we have more than 10 that are in mid or late stage clinical development. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, while antisense medicines have uh, applicability across many types of conditions, metabolic, um, eye diseases, cardiovascular, we do have a pretty big presence in neurological disorders where patient uh, need is high and the community need is great. And these antisense drugs are pretty promising. So on the left are two approved drugs in the neurological space. And then that longer column are, are conditions where we have ASOs in the clinic right now. And then there is a much longer list of conditions that we are looking at in research and doing early stage testing to work ourselves to be ready for the clinic. So we go to the next slide. Um, I wanna to use today to talk at a pretty high level about antisense technology, about what IONIS is working on. And then I'm gonna briefly describe a trial that we've just started in Alexander disease, a rare leukodystrophy. Um, but mostly I just want to you take away what these drugs do and what they don't do and how it might compare to say a gene therapy or to a small molecule drug in development. Um, so at a high level, what you need to understand for ASOs is this central dogma of molecular biology that DNA makes RNA, which makes proteins, where DNA is where all your genes are stored. Thinking back to high school biology, DNA was in the spotlight, uh, which is a shame because it's proteins that are so important. It's proteins that serve as the structure for cells and send messages and respond to viruses and take out the trash. Um, whereas DNA is essentially the recipe book for how to make proteins. Healthy life depends on your ability to make the proteins you need when you need them in the quantity that you need them. So this relationship, this ability to go from DNA to the message, which then goes off to a little machine to make a protein is an important construct to have working correctly. But when you drill down to the to the core problem with a lot of diseases, it's that you have the wrong amount of protein. Either you have too much of a particular protein or too little, or you're making the wrong protein. Um, and that's where antisense technology or ASOs can come in and attempt to correct that. ASOs work at the RNA level. So we're working on that message. The DNA is this double-stranded recipe book. It's, it's kept tight in the nucleus. It's secure. It's protected. Very little can get to it. But to make a protein, first the copy is made called RNA. And the copy of that gene then goes off to be made. And RNA is short-lived. Um, you make it when you need it. You don't make it when you don't need it. Um, but we're going to interact at that RNA level. Gene therapies, for example, are attempting to interact at the DNA level, change the core DNA or introduce a new gene, a new recipe to the recipe book. Um, a lot of small molecules are going to aim to work at the protein level. Once that toxic protein is made, for example, can we get in there and interact with the protein itself in a way that makes it less toxic? Uh, what we're trying to do with antisense technology instead is to change the amount of protein that's made, either up or down or a different protein. So we go to the next slide. On the left is a flowchart of the most commonly exploited ASO mechanism. So this is the one where we're going to downregulate protein. For example, Alexander's disease, where we know that too much of a particular protein is made and our 
goal or therapeutic goal is just have less of that protein made because that should help the patient. So if you follow down on the left-hand side, DNA is making the RNA copy. And then coming in from the right in that purple little strand is the ASO, that's the antisense drug. And it is designed to interact with a specific RNA. And that duplex, once it binds to the RNA, is recognized by the cell as wrong. And the cell has a naturally occurring enzyme called RNAs1, H, sorry, RNAs H1, which knows this is wrong, this shouldn't happen, I shouldn't have RNA bound to something else. It comes in and its action is to chew up the RNA. So if the RNA is chewed up, it can't go off to that machine and make a protein. It's just a bunch of little RNA bits that are gonna get cleared. And when that RNA is chewed up, the ASO is released intact and it can go find another RNA to bind to. So on the right-hand side, these antisense medicines or ASOs, they act on RNA. Depending on how we design them, they can either increase the amount of protein that's made, decrease it through the mechanism shown there on the left, or change the protein that's made by allowing different bits to be included or not in, in the way the protein is processed. ASOs are also highly specific and titratable. Specific meaning when we design these little things, we design them to bind only to the RNA of interest. So in Alexander disease, where we want to knock down the amount of a protein called GFAP, the ASO binds only to GFAP RNA. It's not gonna to bind to any other RNA in the system because we don't wanna interrupt uh, anything else that's going on in the body. We don't wanna interrupt any other proteins that are made. We're just gonna to bind to GFAP. And that specificity is really important in this technology. ASOs are titratable, meaning if you wanna suppress the amount of protein production a little bit, you give a little bit of drug. If you wanna suppress it a lot, you give more drug. And then finally, these are treatments, not cures. Again, we're not touching the DNA. We're not going to change uh, the core instructions. We're just gonna intercept a message to change the amount of protein that's produced. So in the way that you would take a drug for any other chronic condition, you would need to take these drugs chronically to continue to have the desired effect on the RNA level, which then has the desired effect on the protein level. So if we go to the next slide. I think I mentioned um, Alexander disease is a rare leukodystrophy. We just entered the clinic with a GFAP targeting antisense medicine. Um, as a therapeutic approach to treat Alexander. So at the top there, an individual with Alexander disease has a mutation in one of the two uh, core copies of the GFAP gene. And that mutation leads to overproduction of the GFAP protein. And this was figured out probably decades ago that this is the core monogenic cause of the disease. This overexpression of the protein, I mean, that we're making a hundredfold how much GFAP that you would normally make, uh, leads to clumps of GFAP in the cells, which uh, interferes with the cell's ability to do their, do their work. Um, so these clumps called rosin thiofibers are going to sit in the cells and cause problems. But mechanistically, if we can think about just lowering the amount of GFAP that's produced, we might be able to help, help these patients. So what we did was design ASOs that bind specifically to GFAP RNA. And the result of that is that we can have less protein produced. We go to the next slide, just showing graphically kind of how we've proceeded through this program. The idea came to us in 2014, and I'm going across the top row now, um, to target GFAP as a potential treatment for Alexander disease. The first thing we do in all of the programs is make a lot of different ASOs that are gonna target that particular RNA. And we test it in animals. I didn't bring any of the animal data today, but um, there are data published in mice and in rats that are just beautiful. They show reversal of the Rosenthal fibers as clumps of protein go away. All of the biochemical markers that are out of whack in these animal models of disease are normalized and the functional deficits that emerge in the animal models are also corrected just by lowering the amount of the protein that's produced. And then that takes us into the human leads area where we spend some time finding and designing the precise ASO that we want to test in humans. At that point, it gets tested in animals in the way all companies take uh, all their drugs through toxicity studies, that's that step. And at the same time, we're planning for clinical trials. And this work uh, over the last seven years enabled us to get into the clinic just a few months ago. We uh, enrolled our first patients. 
And at the bottom, I think there's a little more information. On the far left, on the bottom, the program began in 2014 in collaboration with Dr. Albie Messing at the University of Wisconsin, who is an expert on Alexander disease and has been working on the problem for decades and just um, had this synergy where he, he saw someone from Ionis give a talk at a conference and said, you know, I bet these ASOs might be able to help here. And he connected with us and we now have this lovely collaboration with him in developing this drug. Um, yeah, I think I've covered the rest of that. So we could go to the next one. The study itself, just in broad terms, um, is a 120 week study during which study participants receive study drug every 12 weeks. So that's either 10 doses of the ASO, which is called ION373, or it's five doses of a placebo followed by five doses of the ASO. So by the end of the study, all participants will receive the investigational drug. This is a gold standard by clinical trials design um, with a placebo controlled study. It was agreed after a lot of discussion with regulators to generate the data that are needed to determine if the drug is safe and effective in the most efficient way. Um, through that though, patients, parents, the, the clinicians and the staff at the clinical study sites and everyone at IONIS are masked to treatment assignments. We won't know until the end of the study who received what drug. On the bottom left, the study drug is administered intrathecally into the CSF by a lumbar puncture. Um, so ASOs don't cross the blood brain barrier, which means if we want them to work in the CNS space, we need to deliver them to the CNS space. So this is the method that we use and we use it across our neuro programs. It's an injection into the lower back, um, into cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that, that bathes the brain and up and down the spine. So we're going in that area below where the spinal cord ends and introducing the drug. And we have some really nice imaging data in animals and in humans to show the drug moving through the, through the CSF and getting into brain tissue. It's, uh, it's a very well um, tolerated procedure. On the right there, uh, we are enrolled in a broad age range, two to 65 years of age. Um, this is because regardless of age or symptoms, this is a really heterogeneous disease by presentation, but regardless of that, uh, we believe that the technology we're using here is addressing the core cause of the disease. So it should be if it is a beneficial drug, it would be beneficial across ages. Um, at clinic visits, participants or their caregivers, if appropriate, will be given tests. Um, there are motor tests and questionnaires to fill out. We are conducting this study around the world. We're gonna have several clinical sites, probably in the teens, although that's still being figured out. Um, because it is such a rare condition and these patients are hard to find, we're dropping centers around the world to try to catch them. And we're shooting for about 42 participants, although the study is designed to allow it go, to go a little bit bigger if that's necessary. The primary goals are to assess safety and tolerability and to measure clinical changes. Um, I'm, I came to the session late, so I don't know if anybody has talked about the progress of clinical trials where you go from phase one to phase two to phase three, classically um, in situations where you have loads of patients to choose from. In these rare diseases, we have some flexibility in the in the way we can develop them through clinical trials and regulators are flexible with us and work with us to design the right trial. Again, everybody is, is interested in getting to definitive data as quickly as possible. And in this situation, while this is a first in human trial, this is the first time we are testing this drug, we're not first testing it in healthy volunteers. We're going right into patients and we've designed the study in a way so that if it is successful, if the drug is proven to be safe and effective, this can be a definitive study toward getting it to a broader population um, through, through an, an improved status. It's a gamble, it's, a, uh, it's an unconventional method to get to a drug approval, um, but that's one of the reasons we spent a lot of time with regulators um, discussing their needs, what kind of data they would need to see uh, so that we could potentially be very efficient here. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, so just really quickly, and this is my last one, and then there are, if there are questions, hopefully we can take those. Um, uh, across the top there, if you're interested in clinical studies, um, the top row is really generic. Talk to your doctor. 
I recommend getting connected to clinicians who are working in research, who do clinical trials, because they are going to be most likely to know what's going on and what's coming. Um, support groups, advocacy groups are fantastic uh, voices for keeping you informed on what's coming. And then clinicaltrials.gov, hopefully everybody's familiar with, is an excellent resource of um, ongoing and, and new clinical trials. And then at the bottom there, if you have any questions about this or anything else that we're working on in the, in the neuro area or the leukodystrophy area, uh, feel free to contact us at that address there.